How was it yesterday? Good time? What else did you guys do? Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day two for the AO Pelvic Cadaver Course. So um, we're going to go through a couple of things today that you've already been through to a large degree. Um, so we're going to go over the fan and steel and some instrumentation through the fan and steel. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the anterior approach to the SI joint and how do we go ahead and get a plate and clamps and all those sorts of things on there uh, safely. And I think that that's something that many people haven't done uh, and hopefully if you have done it, this will give you a little bit more experience in how to do it. So we just wanted to go through a few things. Um, so the fan and steel approach, a couple of different ways. Some people will do a midline split. I think the more traditional fan and steel uh, will come down in that typical fan and steel incision. And that is uh, certainly probably the most popular way to do it. But uh, keep in mind that if you do have a midline uh, exploratory laparotomy incision or anything along those lines, you can continue that incision right down to the symphysis pubis, and that'll go ahead and give you the exposure that you need. Make sure you talk to your, your urologists for patients with bladder injuries. If they're leaving you a catheter right in the middle of your surgical field, uh, certainly not ideal. Uh, so you can certainly have them move it off to the side uh, on the initial insertion, or sometimes you have to have them recited if it's already been there. Uh, but certainly that's going to get in your way. When you do get underneath the skin, uh, you wanna make a midline split through the rectus, through the linea alba, and you're gonna come directly down onto the bone, just making sure that you're protecting the bladder. Now, uh, this seems like the easiest exposure and everyone's done it and we've all been there. There's certainly some obstacles that you will sometimes run into depending on your pattern of injury. The deep exposure is basically just protecting the bladder and elevating a limited portion of the rectus to be able to visualize where your clamp placement will be and also where your plate placement will be. And we'll go over that a little bit in the specimen. Now you want to be cautious because you never know how much of a midline problem you have with the fascia. Uh, so these were two cases right off of incision so that on the left hand side is a testicle that was ejected uh, with an APC type injury and uh, really right underneath the skin on exposure. So um, the only thing hinting us to that was the fact that someone in the emergency room had done an ultrasound and had uh, documented an empty scrotum. That was the only documentation of it. And so really be careful on your physical exam and noting what's missing um, so because you're probably, probably going to find it at some point. And on the right-hand side there, uh, that's a Foley catheter balloon that was right underneath the skin, never made it into the bladder. So really be careful with your exposure uh, on how you're doing this. The second thing I wanted to talk about, and then we'll go to the specimen, is the anterior approach to the SI joint. So uh, I find this particularly helpful. I really uh, probably use this 90% of the time versus a posterior approach to uh, the SI joint for reduction. There are some limitations to it. Certainly if you have uh, an injury to the anterior sacrum, which would be very common with a lateral compression injury, it can be very difficult to uh, instrument the sacrum in the front. But if you have a pure SI joint dislocation, this can be a very good way to get exposure and then also be able to work all the way down into the fan and steel and really work on both sides of the pelvis also as you'll have the patient supine. So we'll go over this a little bit, but really when you're coming down to it, the whole goal here is to be able to protect the L5 nerve root as it comes right across the bone. So at the distal end of the sacrum or the more uh, caudal end, you will see the L5 nerve root within sometimes one centimeter of the SI joint. So you wanna be very cautious about where you go with this because this exposure can really put that at risk. And we're gonna show you that. Uh, once you do have exposure though, and you're, you safely know that you're down on bone and that you haven't uh, injured the L5 nerve root, there are essentially three retractors that will really help you. Uh, one in the, uh, in the actual um, patient, it's very easy to put an, a sharp Holman retractor into the bone of the anterior aspect of uh, S1. Uh, that is very good bone up there. And in the specimen here that we have today, this will not be as high quality bone. So I do not suggest doing that. Uh, you can kind of get your sense of where that Holman goes, but it can be very challenging to actually get any purchase there. Um, and then there's two other retractors, one at the top of the SI joint, really just uh, just in that groove between where the ilium comes over and the posterior aspect of S1. 
And then anteriorly, it does help to put a blunt retractor just at the anterior aspect of the SI joint because that nerve starts to come back a little bit more um, towards the lateral side. So really, if you can get a retractor right there, it will not only help you with your reduction, keep the nerve safe, uh, and also allow you the bandwidth to go ahead and get some plate fixation on there. So we'll go through one case, and then we'll go to the specimen. Uh, this was a 35-year-old woman who had uh, no seatbelt on in the, in the uh, back seat of her car. And uh, she was thrown around and has this very dramatic injury to her pelvic ring. And we see that with this LC3 type injury, her midline is nowhere near her symphysis. And this is the only part of this I really wanted to illustrate was the reduction of the SI joint. So when you have a remarkably injured uh, sacroiliac joint, this was a pure SI joint dislocation, um, this is very difficult to control in multiple planes. So sometimes adding some plate fixation along with clamp fixation can really help you control multiple planes. So we see here two plates applied to the SI joint, and notice that they're only fixed into the sacrum. Then we add a clamp for compression and go ahead and use these plates to help control the rotation of the ilium while adding compression. And then we're able to go ahead and stabilize that with uh, further iliosacral screw fixation. So uh, this can be a very helpful approach in multiple ways, not just for the SI joint, but to go ahead and build your posterior ring so that you can come to the anterior aspect of the ring. Okay, so we're going to move to the specimen now. And we're going to start with the, uh, SI, uh, with the uh, fan and seal approach for the symphysis. So very typical exposure. We're coming out here towards the AS, AS bilaterally, and we're going to go ahead and utilize the typical fan and seal type incision. When you go ahead and open that incision up, and go ahead and find that linea alba and make a midline split in the linea. So once you open that up, here we're not finding any uh, parts that don't belong, luckily. Once we open that up, you can go ahead and enter the space of Retzius down here. So this is going to be the space of Retzius. This is the bladder behind. And then in front, we've exposed our symphysis right in the midline here. You don't have to peel down the entirety of the rectus here, but you want to peel this out towards the lateral side, and you can go ahead and bring a Homan retractor or a baby bandit or something along the side there. Now you'll notice here, and we'll do this on the left side of the cadaver here, that as you start to get off of your pubic body here, you have a dramatic fall off in your height. And that's going to change uh, your plate placement and if you have to bend the plate in accordance. So um, people have different uh, ideas as to what they will utilize for plate fixation. Uh, I know for myself, it's typically for an APC2 type injury. I'll go ahead and use a four hole plate typically, but in an APC3, I'm gonna go want more stability and I may go to a six hole or for many other different reasons too. You might want to discuss that with your table instructors, what kind of their thought patterns are for the different plates. So once you have everything protected, a malleable retractor can be very helpful here to protect the bladder. And you see the posterior aspect of the pubic body here. And knowing where that is can be very helpful as far as getting the alignment of the screws. It's not uncommon when you have an APC3 type injury with a dramatic injury to the symphysis that you may even find in a male, you may find the, the shaft of the penis really up here. So you'll find the uh, right in between the symphysis. So you may have to actually work through the space of retius to bring that back down to be able to close off that symphysis. You'll find on your tables, you'll find uh, six hole plates. Um, and these are a little bit more stout than typical recon plates. They also have uh, locations here that you can go ahead and repair the rectus to. And this is what I was mentioning a few minutes ago. When you do place your plate, and we all have a little bit of variation in where we place it, you can talk with your table instructors about that. But if you are in the midline, this third hole typically will not be down on bone. So you may have to go ahead and bend the third hole of the plate on each side down pretty significantly and bring the screws back towards the midline. So you can go ahead and instrument that and see what angles work best for your instrumentation. Typically, your drill angle 
is extremely laid down on the body so that you can get uh, right down into that pubic body and that's how you get those very long screws going down. So go ahead and uh, work that in your cadaver today. <clears throat> so the next thing we want to do is go ahead and show you the anterior approach to the sacroiliac joint. So we're going to come out to this side of the specimen here. So <clears throat> yesterday, as a part of the anterior intrapelvic approach, we went ahead and we, yeah, if we could just come out a little bit. We went ahead and we utilized the lateral window portion of this. So if we could bring the shot out just a little bit more. Here I marked the ASIS, and you can see we have a bit of a bridge in between the fan and steel and the lateral window here. And that's, sometimes that bridge is smaller or larger, and it also depends on whether or not you might want to do the ASIS osteotomy. As Dr. Saji was mentioning yesterday, you want to go ahead and make sure that you planned to do the osteotomy ahead of time, and however you're going to do that, whether, whether a step cut osteotomy or a simple osteotomy, you'd like to leave as much of the muscle bellies on that osteotomy so that it can be digastric. And I think that a number of people had the chance to do that yesterday, but if you did not have the chance to do that osteotomy, go ahead and do that and see how far down uh, the anterior column that gets you. But when we're looking at the anterior aspect of the SI joint, it's a typical lateral window exposure. So we have our incision, and then we come down, and up here you see that we've reflected where the external oblique was coming over the top of the ilium. We've gone ahead and really found the bottom of that muscle. So finding the bottom of the muscle here and bring, oh, sorry about that, bringing that muscle all the way up, okay? And you can go ahead and place a retractor down across the pelvic brim, and that's going to be the most helpful retractor to you in the beginning. And then you can continue to build your exposure all the way back to the SI joint. Usually it helps. You get a little bit lost up here as you get a little bit more proximal on the ilium. I like to go ahead and actually get that exposure and release of the external oblique from the inside as you work back. <clears throat> now, I like to use Deaver retractors. Here we have sweet, uh, Sweetheart retractor. Anything that can give you good exposure out here. And this is really going to show you the L5 nerve root. So if you take a look in there, I got it. Yep. So if you take a look in here, this is the inner table of the ilium. This is the SI joint here. And then as we look here, you see the white structure here. That is the L5 nerve root. Now, most times we don't plan on exposing the L5 nerve root, uh, but we just want to know exactly where it is. So if we see here, this is a very good example of really we're about uh, 1.2 centimeters away from the SI joint here at the distal aspect, and approximately you could see quite a bit more bone up in here. So we're not going to go, you can go, certainly go looking for the L5 nerve root today to get yourself comfortable with that, if you could take that in it. And that will be uh, quite helpful for you. Now, as far as getting the reduction of the sacroiliac joint here, uh, there are a number of different ways to do it. One of the ways we just went over in the, uh, uh, in the PowerPoint there was to go ahead and use a plate that's applied here as a buttress, and that can be applied here, and the second plate can be applied very proximally all the way up here. In order to get that exposure, it can help to go ahead and add another Holman retractor up here. So you can get a plate placement here and a plate placement down in here, and that can be very helpful. But sometimes you still need to get compression across here. One of the easier ways to do that is to go ahead and use a Farabuff clamp or a Youngbluff clamp and go ahead and place a screw in between those plates onto the sacrum and also onto the ilium, and then you can get a nice squeeze here and go ahead and get your compression. And then being in the supine position, it makes it quite easy to then go ahead and add your iliosacral screw trajectories uh, quite easily. So one thing to pay attention to and this last thing we'll go into is the plate. So the plate shape, typically we, I use either a three or a four hole plate, and you need a pretty good bend here to get it into the right position. When you're bringing it down onto the bone here, you could see the plate position here 
will allow for uh, adequate space to go ahead and put the uh, further fixation or reduction clamps into place. So we'll go ahead and place a screw into the sacrum here. So you can see here that that trajectory is very much up and down. So you want to stay lateral to the, uh, to the foramen in the sacrum. So we'll go ahead and bring x-ray in. So we'll go ahead with an AP x-ray here. Okay. So certainly we see a uh, reasonable location of our plate with one hole onto the sacrum, and then if we could come to an outlet view. <laughs> okay, so we're at 30 degrees there. We can see if you could push in a little bit towards me. Another shot. Oh, pull back a little bit towards you, sorry. Extra there. So you can see that we are lateral to the frame in there on that view. And then if we go ahead to the inlet, utilizing the inlet with a little bit of over the top, we'll go ahead and let us look right down that SI joint. And we can see our location of our fixation and also uh, the reduction of the SI joint. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and get started with that. If you have any uh, questions, um, sorry about that, if you have any uh, Questions, please talk with your table instructors about how you're going to go ahead and do that. The anterior approach to the SI joint, really look for the L5 nerve root and then really look at the plate placement along the symphysis. Great, let's get started.